When we're studying the lives of people in the 18th century, it is rather easy to research someone who is rich or important. If we want to know something about George Washington, there are reams of data about George Washington. Letters he's written, people wrote letters about him, there are paintings. There's all this information about somebody like a George Washington in history. Uh, but it gets much more difficult when we're trying to understand the lives of ordinary people in the 18th century, or even more difficult, poor people in the 18th century. So, uh, one of the places we can go uh, is uh, travel journals, and we get people describing their travels in the 18th century. And there are a number of travel journals, and they are so, so illuminating. Uh, they give us so much depth and interest depending on the person and the time period and where they're traveling. There are some very, very uh, interesting adventures written about early 18th century. One of these journals that I really enjoy is the journal of Sarah Kemble Knight. She writes about a journey that she's having in 1704. This is very early. and She's traveling in the Northeast area, New York and Massachusetts, Connecticut. And at the time, this was pretty rough country that she was traveling, and she traveled this alone, on horseback, for the most part. Uh, and she was a, a woman of some uh, wealth. She, she uh, had a store, and she did business, and, and uh, she was uh, obviously a very extraordinary uh, woman. But she describes a particular time when uh, she was traveling, she was very weary, and she decided to stay at a particular house and uh, because it was the closest thing around. And she had to wait until uh, the river wasn't as high so she could cross it because there were, were not very many bridges or very many ferries to get you across. So many times you had to wade across a river. She says, uh, and now I'm at my lowest ebb by reason of my weary, very weary, hungry, and uneasy circumstances. So taking leave of my company, she was traveling with a few extra people, though with no little reluctance that I could not proceed with them on my journey, I stopped at a little cottage by the river to wait the waters falling, which the old man that lived there said would be in a little time, and he would conduct me safe over. This little hut was one of the wretchedest I'd ever saw for a habitation of human creatures. It was supported with shores um, and closed with ca uh, clapboards, laid on lengthwise and so much asunder that light comes through everywhere. The door tied on with a cord in the place of hinges, the floor, the bare earth, no windows but such as the thin covering afforded, nor any furniture but a bed with a glass bottle hanging at the head of it, an earthen cup, a small pewter basin, a board with sticks to stand on instead of a table, and a block or two in the corner instead of chairs. The family were an old man, his wife, and two children, all and every part being the picture of poverty. Notwithstanding, both the hut and its inhabitants were very clean and tidy, with the crossing the old proverb that bare walls make giddy housewives. She goes on to relate more of this particular story about staying there, waiting for the waters to recede. Uh, somebody comes along and she gets across and, and uh, describes this. I, I, I thought that... Um, uh, the this particular encounter, well, in fact, her whole journal, very, very interesting, all the different encounters. She's very uh, a very funny writer and um, illuminating, certainly for what this woman of fairly well-to-do means is uh, as she describes the countryside and the places that she visits. But she gives us this wonderful description of what's happening in the cabin, doesn't she? Uh, this house that's made, it's shored up, so it's probably just sticks, right? And it's got clapboards, probably rived out uh, little planks that are put on for <laughs> the walls and hardly a door. And then just the amount of uh, items that are within this house. Such a wonderful description. Uh, and she's indebted to these people for helping her out. Uh, and, and she even at, uh, after this little portion, she has a little piece of verse talking about this encounter very, 
very interesting, uh, wonderful picture of what it was like for someone living in very poor circumstances uh, in this northeast area in 1704. This next journal, um, very, another very interesting journal. In 1728, William Byrd accepts a commission to go out uh, and with a number of commissioners and surveyors and woodsmen and survey the line, the official uh, demarcation between North Carolina and Virginia, and this is 1728, again, early. And the area that they're surveying is very wild, unpopulated, uh, and he relates uh, this a particular uh, expedition. He, he relates the uh, things that go on with it. He has, he actually records two different ones, the official one and the secret one, the one that isn't necessarily meant to be public. And the secret one is the one I've got here. Um, a very, very interesting reading because, you know, it's, he doesn't have to be official, right? And uh, I will I will read uh, or I will probably do future uh, episodes about what happens on the expedition because that is really interesting reading uh, about you know how this how this group functions what they have where they go you know what happens to them but there's this little part that I wanted to relate here and this is at the very end when he's getting back to civilization and they're sort of breaking up the group. This is probably, again, in a fairly backwoods uh, Virginia. And he writes, he says, I made a visit to Cornelius Keith, who lived in a, uh, rather in a pen than a house, with his wife and six children. I never beheld such a scene of poverty in this happy part of the world. The hovel they lay in had no roof to cover uh, those wretches from the injuries of the weather, but when it rained or was colder than ordinary, the whole family took refuge in a fodder stack. So they all found a haystack to hide under instead of being in the house. The poor man had raised a kind of a house, but for want of nails, it remained uncovered. It gave him, I gave him a note on, Mr., on Major Mumford for nails for that purpose, so making the whole family happy at a very small expense. The man can read and write very well, and by way of a trade he can make and set up quern stones, and yet is poorer than any Highland Scot or bog-trotting Irishman. So here's a man who has a family. He's uh, probably moved out into this frontier area uh, that, that he's in, and he has started to build his cabin, uh, but he only has the walls up and he doesn't have uh, and the walls he could make without any nails all he needed was a tool and uh, and the logs just like we saw in or the uh, the barn video that that we've like part one of the barn where they they raise uh, the walls up and then you get to the roof and what do you do it gets to be a lot more difficult how do you put a roof on a house or a cabin without any nails and this man did not have that skill and so there his house sat he didn't have the money for the nails couldn't go any further um, so so they have to they have to um, shelter themselves in other places waiting for the time when they have the nails and, and luckily um, this person takes pity on them and just gives them the money so that that they can put uh, a roof on their house and he goes on to describe this man as being able to read and write, and he has a trade of setting up quern stones, which are, he's talking about millstones there. Quern's are usually small mills that you would have in your house, fairly probably rare in the 18th century, but of course this is fairly early on, so that's before there are a lot of bigger mills set up in areas. So a hand quern, a hand mill, uh, might be something that was a little bit more common uh, in the colonies. I, I have not seen that many references to querns. So he could mean larger millstones, uh, and he just used uh, the word for smaller millstones. But two really very interesting uh, descriptions of situations with uh, poor people, what their houses were like, what the people were like, at least in certain circumstances here, uh, so that, that we can get a glimpse, we can get a picture of what just one or two again these are just anecdotal uh, sort of um, 
descriptions of people, but that's what we have to work with. We can learn so much by going back, digging into these uh, journals, into these writings. They're so very interesting, illuminating, uh, understanding what life for common people, poor people was uh, in the 18th century, in the early 18th century, in these circumstances. And it helps us understand our life today, doesn't it? Boy, puts everything into perspective very rapidly. <laughs> I am so happy that uh, that I can curl up in a nice warm bed and I can be warm whenever I want to. Uh, but then I can come out here and I can I can experience uh, some of what it was like uh, to understand um, just how difficult life must have been in the 18th century. These journal readings are so very illuminating. I'll try to put a link down in the description section to point you to some of uh, both of these uh, works. I think uh, we'll be able to find them on uh, uh, online in readings. And if not, I'll make sure to put a link to uh, an Amazon book or something. So thank you guys so much for coming along and um, having this adventure, this adventure in early 18th century in the lives of poor people journeying. We're on this journey too, just like uh, these folks. Uh, we're just experiencing it on the other side. So, uh, so experiencing what it was like it just so just trying to imagine it is is so uh, very very interesting and a great thought experiment. So thanks for coming along uh, with me today. Thank you for all your uh, just tremendous support for what we do here on the channel. Watching our videos, commenting, sharing, uh, going to our store, our merch, whatever you know, all the things you do. Thank you so much for that, and thanks for watching today.